Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, your Monday show of all the news relating to everything spaceflight that happened last week and all the stuff set to happen this week. We also dabble in discussion of the best historic anniversaries relating to spaceflight set to take place over the coming days, so there's a lot to talk about. Before we get going, make sure you've subscribed below so that you see these videos as soon as they go up, every Monday, so that the news we're about to talk about is as relevant and up to date as possible and not like three weeks behind schedule. But enough dilly dally, let's transition to our first segment, all the launches that we saw last week. We start off right at the beginning of the week on Monday the 14th when, at 5am coordinated universal time, Russia launched the second orbital prototype of their brand new Angara A5 rocket from the Plesetska Cosmodrome. This was the second successful orbital flight of the Angara A5 and its mass simulator payload successfully made it to geosynchronous Earth orbit without a hitch. The main purpose of the Angara family of rockets is to replace the current Proton launch system. Russia wants to cut ties with Proton for a couple of reasons, chiefly to try and reduce their dependency on the Baikonur Cosmodrome, which is located in Kazakhstan and currently the only place that the Proton can launch from. The Proton also uses toxic hydrazine fuel, while the Angara does not. With this latest flight under their belts, Russia is now a step closer to being able to launch satellites to geosynchronous orbit from their own territory, from either the Plesetska Cosmodrome or the upcoming Vostokny Cosmodrome, while at the same time significantly increasing environmental safety both in the areas adjacent to the launch complex and in the drop zones. Once operational, the Angara A5 will be able to lift 24,000 kg payloads to low Earth orbit, exceeding the Proton's 23,000 kg capacity and placing the Angara A5 very close to the Long March 5B's 25,000 kg capacity. The next day, we saw Rocket Lab's 17th Electron mission, the Owl's Night Begins, successfully launched from the Mahia Peninsula launch site in New Zealand, placing the Strix Alpha satellite into low Earth orbit on behalf of Tokyo-based company Synspective. This is Synspective's first satellite and will operate as a technology demonstration for the firm, hopefully paving the way for a full constellation of 30 satellites that will provide global imaging coverage of Earth. The Strix Alpha is a synthetic aperture radio satellite, which means that it can see through clouds and other occlusive weather conditions down to the surface of the Earth to detect millimeter level changes. It's this ability that inspired the launch mission's name of the Owl's Night Begins, coupled with the fact that Strix is the genus of owls. This mission brings an end to another successful year of launches for Rocket Lab, with only one out of the seven Electron missions they've done this year ending in failure. Interestingly, the one failure be the Electron on Rocket's 13th mission. Hmm. <laughs> I'm excited to see what the company pulls in 2021, from more booster recoveries to their first US launch from Wallops Island in Virginia. The same day as Electron, we saw another small sat launch vehicle take flight. This was Astra's Rocket 3.2, and unlike its predecessor, the Rocket 3.1, this time it actually made it into space. There was no payload on board the rocket, Astra's Rocket 3 vehicle is still very much in development, so the only thing being carried was a dummy mass simulator payload. Rocket 3.2 took flight at approximately 9pm UTC and successfully passed the Kármán line, the 100km altitude generally considered as the beginning of space, and then begun accelerating to orbital velocity with its upper stage engine. Unfortunately, the engine shut down around 12-15 to 15 seconds too early when it depleted its fuel, leaving the rocket at a speed of 7.2 km per second, just half a kilometer per second short of orbital velocity. Despite not quite achieving orbit, Astra considered the launch a huge success, and rightly so. This is only the company's second ever launch attempt, and to get so close is a very promising sign of things going right in the future. And don't forget that SpaceX didn't get to space for the first time until their fourth launch. Astra didn't have a live stream of the launch, instead they uh, enthusiastically tweeted each time the rocket passed a certain milestone on its journey, from Max-Q, main engine cutoff, stage separation, 
Common line pass, and of course, mission success. <laughs> Rocket 3.2 is the second of the three flights Astra intend to fly in order to prove their orbital capability, with Rocket 3.3 being around 75% completed as you're watching this video. Astra Chief Executive Chris Kemp stated that the outcome of this mission was surprisingly successful, and certainly a nice Christmas present for the team, and that everyone at Astra are beyond ecstatic by the Rocket 3.2's flight. I for one can't wait to see Rocket 3.3, considering how much more successful Rocket 3.2 was compared with the 3.1, which crashed very shortly after liftoff. I'm keeping my fingers and toes crossed that the 3.3 will be the vehicle to carry the team all the way to Earth orbit. On the 16th of December, we saw the successful return of China's Chang'e 5 moon mission. Launched on the 23rd of November aboard the recently developed Long March 5 heavy lift rocket, Chang'e 5 is the first sample return mission to the moon since the Soviet Union's Luna 24 in 1976. This mission was entirely robotic, landing near the Ocean of Storms in the northwest region of the moon's near side. This area contains geological units that are as young as 1.21 billion years old, compared to the samples returned by Apollo that were aged between 3.1 and 4.4 billion years old. The relatively young age of the samples returned by the Chang'e 5 will be invaluable to scientists who can use them to better calibrate techniques for estimating the ages of geological surfaces on planets, moons and asteroids throughout the solar system. The Ascension module separated from the lander on December the 3rd, achieving lunar orbit six minutes later and docking with the orbiter returner component two days later. The orbiter and returner module successfully fired its four engines to head back to Earth on December the 13th, and last week on the 16th, the mission was over. What a mission it was though. China don't plan to stop conducting missions anytime soon either. They plan to launch Chang'e 6, 7 and 8 over the next 7 years and have been conducting preliminary studies for a crewed landing in the 2030s and possibly building an outpost near the lunar south pole with international cooperation. The time to be alive is now, ladies and gents. The following day, on December the 17th, we saw India launch their latest PSLV XL rocket from the Satish Dhawan Space Center. I've had to distort the footage a little bit so that they don't copyright claim this video, but hopefully you can make out just enough to get the gist of it. On board was the latest generation Indian communication satellite, the CMS-01, which was successfully delivered to geosynchronous orbit. The CMS-01 will replace the aging GSAT-12 and will provide services like tele-education, telemedicine, disaster management support and satellite internet access. Next up, on December the 18th, we had the successful launch of a Soyuz 2.1 rocket operated jointly by Ariane Space and Starsem, a French-Russian launch company. The old faithful Soyuz took flight from the relatively new spaceport of Vostokny, Russia, and it successfully deployed 36 satellites for the OneWeb satellite constellation. These will join the existing satellites, of which six were launched in 2019 and a further 68 were launched in February and March of 2020. The company behind OneWeb is part partly funded by the UK government and partly by Barty Global in a deal struck after they filed for bankruptcy protection in March this year. After emerging from said bankruptcy in July, thanks to the deal struck with the UK government and Barty Global, they can continue their mission to construct a constellation of 648 satellites that will provide global high bandwidth connectivity for use in Earth-based networks. We had hoped to see the SpaceX Falcon 9 Enrol 108 mission launch on the 17th of December, but unfortunately the mission faced a few delays, firstly after some concerns regarding unfavourable weather conditions, and then after an auto-abort at T-1 minute and 53 seconds due to a second stage sensor reading. The mission was ultimately held after SpaceX stated they needed more time to analyse the data. The new launch window was Saturday the 19th of December, which hasn't actually happened yet as I edit this video, so there's a fairly good chance that by the time this video is uploaded on Monday, it'll have gone without a hitch. Yes, sadly, with Christmas closing in, I haven't been able to edit today's video as last minute as I'm normally able to, I'm afraid. Here's hoping that the mission succeeded though, or succeeds this week if it's delayed again. The payload is a classified satellite for the United States National Reconnaissance Office, so we obviously can't talk about what it is in great detail since its identity and purpose are classified. This will be the fifth outing for this particular Falcon 9 first stage, and if all goes to plan, or if all went to plan, it'll touch down at landing zone 1 shortly after second stage separation. 
Our final expected launch of the week was on Sunday the 20th of December and was the first ever flight of the Chinese Long March 8. Much like the aforementioned Falcon 9, this video's editing had to be completed before the launch date and time, so I can't definitively say if this happened or not, unfortunately. But if it did happen, then it's very exciting news! This is because the Long March 8 follows the SpaceX Falcon 9 design philosophy of a self-landing reusable first stage. On board, the rocket will be a Chinese, Jinjishu Yanzhen technology demonstration satellite, as well as an Earth observation satellite made jointly by China and Ethiopia. I very much hope this mission succeeds, or succeeded, depending on if it actually launched or if it faced any more delays. Moving on down now to Boca Chica, Texas, work continues on Starship and Super Heavy. Not a lot of major developments have taken place since last week's episode. I mean, let's be real here, it's going to be hard to top the SN8 news from last week. Though, on the subject of the dearly departed prototype, SpaceX have begun sweeping away its remains and clearing up the launch site. The SN9, which sustained some damage following a malfunction with its stand inside the high bay that resulted in it falling over, has been undergoing repair work, though it is still unknown if the damage dealt to the vehicle will prevent it from completing its planned high-altitude flight. One would assume that if SpaceX are confident enough to invest the time and energy into repairing the SN9, then they still have hope that it'll be able to perform its planned mission without any problems. But that's a wrap on the news of last week, so now let's take a look into the launches we can look forward to in the coming days. Assuming that the Falcon 9 and Long March 8 launches that were planned to happen last week don't face any further delay, pushing them to this week, then there aren't actually any planned rocket flights over the next seven days, at least ones that have been confirmed as I write this script. However, I'm most likely not going to be able to produce a space this week for next Monday, given the holiday season and all, so we can quickly talk about next week, and it's still a fairly quick summary to be honest, since there's only one launch that's been confirmed so far, the launch of an Ariane space-operated Soyuz rocket from the French Guiana Space Centre. On board is a Composant Spatial Optique, which in English translates to Optical Space Component, which is a French military Earth observation satellite launched unsurprisingly, on behalf of the French Armed Forces. The target destination is low Earth orbit, and given the legendary reliability of the Soyuz rocket, I'm expecting to see this mission succeed without any issue. But as stated earlier, that's it for all the officially announced launches. There is, of course, always the possibility of a surprise launch announcement from somewhere, as there are still a slew of launches slated to supposedly take flight in 2020, but with the year drawing to a close, who knows how many, if any, will actually transpire. But what I can talk about with complete reliability, since it's already happened, is all the best spaceflight anniversaries set to take place this week, so let's do that! This week's spaceflight history segment is all about Apollo 8. It was the first crewed spacecraft to leave low Earth orbit and the first to reach the moon, orbit it, and return. Its three-man crew, Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Anders, were the first humans to fly to the moon, witness and photograph an Earth rise, and escape the gravity of a celestial body as they made their return to Earth. The first major milestone in the mission, as with most space missions, was the launch. The gigantic Saturn V launch vehicle thundered to life today, Monday the 21st in 1968, which was the first crewed flight of the legendary rocket. On their way to the moon, one of the crew members, probably William Anders, took the first ever photograph of the entire Earth. And here it is! Bear in mind that South is up here, South America is in the middle. 68 hours after launch on December the 24th, the Apollo spacecraft arrived at the moon, whereupon it fired its engines retrograde for just over four minutes, capturing into an orbit around 70 miles above the lunar surface. The crew would continue to orbit for the next 20 hours, completing 20 orbits of the moon in total. During their time above the moon, they made a Christmas Eve television broadcast in which they read the first 10 verses from the Book of Genesis, and the broadcast, at the time, was the most watched TV program ever. After its fourth pass around the moon, the crew witnessed an Earth rise in person for the first time in human history, and Anders took the now famous Earth rise photo. The next day, Christmas Day, on December the 25th, the crew of Apollo 8 performed the first successful trans-Earth injection manoeuvre, sending the spacecraft on a trajectory back to Earth from lunar orbit. 
Two days later, on the 27th, we'll celebrate the anniversary of the Apollo 8's successful splashdown in the Pacific Ocean, bringing an end to the first ever orbital crewed mission to the moon. Other notable anniversaries that took place this week were on December the 25th when, in the year zero, the baby Jesus was born. But 2003 years later, in 2003, the ill-fated Beagle 2 probe, which was released from the European Space Agency's spacecraft a few days earlier on December the 19th, stopped transmitting shortly before its scheduled landing. It was intended to conduct an astrobiology mission that would have looked for past life on and down to 1.5 meters under the surface of Mars, and its fate went unknown until early 2015, when it was finally located on photographs taken by NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, where it was found that the spacecraft had apparently landed safely, but two of its four solar panels had failed to deploy, blocking its communications antenna. So close, yet so far. The second Christmas Day anniversary to celebrate took place one year after Beagle 2 in 2004, when the Cassini orbiter released the Huygens probe, which successfully landed on Saturn's moon Titan on January the 14th, 2005. This was the first spacecraft to land on Titan, and the farthest landing from Earth a spacecraft has ever made. It gathered data during its descent through the atmosphere, and continued to transmit data for another 90 minutes after touchdown. At the landing site, there were indications of pebbles of water ice scattered over the orange surface of Titan, the majority of which is covered by a thin haze of methane. Photos taken before the landing showed what appeared to be large drainage channels crossing the lighter coloured mainland into a dark sea though it later turned out that this C was the eventual landing site of the spacecraft, so this area likely represents a dry lake bed. Further data from the Cassini mission definitively confirmed the presence of permanent liquid hydrocarbon lakes elsewhere on Titan, though. The surface of Titan, as photographed by the lander, appears to be best described as a sand made of ice grains, or snow that has been frozen on top. The images show a flat plain covered in pebbles, and these pebbles appear to be somewhat rounded, possibly due to the action of fluids on them. The temperature at the landing site was 93.8 Kelvin, or minus 179.3 degrees Celsius, or minus 290.8 degrees Fahrenheit, and a pressure of 1.45 atmospheres. Titan is certainly a very interesting location in the solar system, and I can't wait to see future missions visit this mysterious world where, who knows, perhaps there's some form of life lurking within the depths of its hydrocarbon lakes or somewhere else on the surface. Who can really say for sure? Either way, any of these discoveries would be taking place in the future, and the future is not something we discuss in our history segment, which can only mean one thing. The history segment is over, so now we can awkwardly transition to the next part. Just cut to play the play the transition. <laughs> And that's it for today's episode of Space This Week, and with the lack of any real news for the rest of 2020, this may end up being the last Space This Week of the year. It's been fun making these videos, and I hope you've enjoyed the journeys that we've taken together on this show so far. I don't plan on stopping in 2021, especially considering the prospect of more Starship flights, the first flight of New Glenn, and definitely actually SLS this guys, don't worry that it was delayed from late 2016, October 2017, November 2018, November 2019, June 2020, and April 2021. It will definitely, definitely be November 2021 now for real. I tell you what will be launching soon though, Lown Aerospace's Christmas Special Kerbal Mission, which will take flight on December the 26th, so make sure you're subscribed for that one. On screen are more of my videos, on the left hand side is a link to the full Space This Week playlist, the one on the right is a link to a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm based on your viewing habits, there's also links to check out my merchandise and stuff in the description, and my Patreon, Twitter, Discord, Instagram, all that good stuff. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you have an excellent new year.